Today's kids are so spoiled for choice when it comes to lunchtime at school. A juicy Whopper with Taco Bell tacos on the side? You got it. An ice cold Coke to wash it down? Coming right up. While these aren't the healthiest of choices, the variety of options make it a dream compared to what their grandparents had as kids in the 1950s. So what kind of choices did they have at school cafeterias back then? Come and see for yourself. Up until the late 1800s, which was way before my time, mind you, the school lunch system was that you bring your own food to school. Even though they seem ancient to you, lunch ladies didn't exist back then. The school lunch, as we know it today, all started thanks to Ellen Swallow Richards, an important woman who was a pioneer in nutrition and home economics. You also have her to thank for launching the very first school lunch program in America in 1894, a time when many kids, especially those from poor and immigrant families, often went hungry because they didn't have much. Bless her heart, Richards was in charge of the New England Kitchen Company she set up to make sure that the needy had affordable meals within their reach. And apart from the poor, she also saw that children at school didn't eat much in between science and math classes. I mean, how do you expect to understand fractions on an empty stomach? To solve this, she started giving out hot lunches at Boston Latin School, the oldest public school in America. The best part is that it didn't cost the students a single penny. The menu was very humble by today's standards. Usually it was some kind of soup paired with bread and butter. It wasn't much, but it was something to keep the children going through the school day. After Ellen Swallow Richards paved the way with her school lunch program, the idea caught on in Boston and Philadelphia. By the early 1900s, these cities began to adapt her system. At first, they were spearheaded by charity organizations. Out of the kindness of their hearts, they prepared food in central kitchens and then delivered it to the schools participating in the program. By 1913, there were about 40 school lunch programs around the country, each one ready to give a hot meal to students for just a penny or sometimes completely free. The menus were simple yet nourishing with items like pea soup, rice pudding, and lentils. The goal was to make sure that kids had something warm in their bellies to help them get through the school day, especially since hot meals were becoming a must around this time. But feeding kids with warm lunches wasn't their only goal. One of the unspoken reasons as to why these early public school lunch programs was to Americanize the tastes of immigrant children. At home, the Italian kids ate pasta and Chinese children had their delicious dim sum for dinner. But at school, they were eating Scrapple with a side of mashed potatoes. This subliminal push towards American cuisine was a way to help these young immigrants integrate into American society. They were learning, maybe without even realizing it, that to be part of the broader American culture, they would need to develop a taste for its food. For some, it helped bridge the gap between their cultural heritage and their new American identity. By the time the Great Depression rolled around, the country was hit hard and food rations were one of the many areas that suffered with the times. Food was scarce and finding work even more so. Families struggled to put meals on the table and many children went hungry, leading to a huge rise in malnutrition among the youth. President Roosevelt, as part of his New Deal, took action to address this crisis. He bought surplus food from struggling farmers, which as an added bonus, helped support the agricultural sector. He then hired thousands of out-of-work women to cook and serve meals to hungry public school students. This program was a lifesaver for everyone and proved to be so successful that by 1941, every state had a lunch program in place. But as the United States turned its attention from the Great Depression to World War II, the long-term effects of those lean years became obvious in a way you wouldn't expect. When the country began calling up young men to fight, recruiters weighed the young boys and discovered that up to a third of them were unfit for service because they haven't been eating enough. This shocking revelation forced the government to hone in on children's welfare. They finally saw 
that the health of the nation's youth was not just a matter of personal well-being, but a critical issue of national security. Funny enough, nowadays, we're facing the opposite issue. Almost one out of every five Americans are unfit for service, not because of malnutrition, but because of obesity. We really have to learn to put the Big Macs down. So after the struggles of the Great Depression and World War II, the importance of proper nutrition for kids became clear as day. President Harry Truman saw this and took a big step to address it. In 1946, he signed the National School Lunch Act into law. This act was all about making sure that children in schools across America had access to healthy and affordable lunches. The government wanted every kid to get the chance to eat a nutritious meal at school, no matter their family's financial situation. Here's how it worked. The government provided funding and food to schools to help them set up lunch programs. Schools would get money to help cover the cost of the meals, and they'd also receive surplus food from the government, things like milk, cheese, and canned vegetables. Basically, it was a higher budget version of Ellen Swallow Richards's school lunch program. The idea was to make sure that kids got at least one good meal a day. These meals needed to be nutritious, so they included things like protein, fruits, vegetables, and dairy. By doing this, the government expected the health and well-being of children to improve, making sure they were better prepared to learn and grow and, if need be, fight for the country. Now that we got that out of the way, it's time for us to go on our lunch break. And since we aren't going on any ordinary lunch break, it's going to cost you one like. So go ahead and pause this video, hit that like button, and keep watching when you're done. The post-war boom brought about a rise in pre-packaged convenience foods. These were the days when TV dinners and quick fix meals became all the rage. The government, looking to keep food costs down, encouraged schools to adopt these convenient options for their lunch programs. They started to veer away from the belief that hot meals were essential. With a focus on pinching pennies, the emphasis on serving hot, nutritious meals went out the door. This meant that schools didn't always cook hot meals on site. Instead, they turned to more convenient, often prepackaged options that didn't need the same level of preparation. But all this cost cutting had a downside, and it was the nutritional quality of school lunches that took a nosedive. Although schools were still serving meals that were calorie dense, these meals just didn't have the necessary nutrients that growing kids needed. Instead of fresh vegetables, fruits, and lean proteins, the menus were filled with items like cheese, meatloaf, and sausage shortcake. These foods were filling, but didn't offer much in terms of vitamins, minerals, or overall nutritional value. While kids were getting enough to eat in terms of calories, they weren't exactly getting the right kinds of food to support their health and development. In the 1950s, the cost of a school lunch was insanely affordable, ranging from 25 to 50 cents depending on where you lived or where you went to school, of course. Dirt cheap, isn't it? Imagine how many lunches today's kids could buy with their lunch money. Half a dollar was a reasonable price for many families, and rightly so, given the low nutritional value these meals had in them. Despite all the talk about school lunches being unhealthy in the 50s, cafeterias still tried to include a balance of protein, carbohydrates, and vegetables. It helped that they were pretty tasty too. I guess you could say that providing this structured meal was their way of making up for what they lacked in nutritional value. A typical school lunch tray back then would typically have a slice of ham, a serving of meatloaf, or a piece of fried chicken as the main dish. This was accompanied by a serving of mashed potatoes or a roll of bread, and the vegetable portion was often a dollop of canned green beans, corn, or a small salad. Sometimes, if you got lucky, there'd be a special item like applesauce or a small dessert, maybe a piece of cake or a cookie to round out the meal. Cafeterias were also well stocked with dairy products. They went heavy on the cheese in many meals, from cheese sandwiches to cheese-topped casseroles. 
Other dairy products like butter and cream were also used in dishes, and when it came to drinks, the selection all across America was easy to remember. Milk. Whether it was white milk or, if you're really lucky, chocolate milk, that was the standard beverage offered with school lunches. Milk was seen as an essential part of a child's diet because it was a good source of calcium and other nutrients. For school kids living in France at this time, their drink selection was a bit more R-rated. It was common for schools in France to include wine as part of the school lunch for children. Yes, you heard that right. Schools gave alcohol to kids. This practice was deeply rooted in French culinary culture and traditions, where wine is considered a complement to meals, even for children. This practice was seen as a way to educate children about the role of wine in French cuisine and culture, teaching them about the appreciation of food and drink as part of a holistic dining experience. Unbelievable, I know. Why didn't my parents send me off to France back then? Now let's fly back to America. Thanks to the Americanization movement, the variety of school lunches was still very limited and there was still a noticeable absence of ethnic foods. You wouldn't even find rice on the menu. The focus was still very much on doing things the American way. If you were from the Mid-Atlantic, one of the tastiest options that would sometimes show up on the menu was Scrapple. It, you don't know what that is. Scrapple is a dish made from pork scraps and trimmings combined with, you know, cornmeal, wheat flour, and spices. This mixture is formed into a loaf and then sliced and fried. It's a regional favorite known for its savory, crispy exterior and soft interior. In Catholic schools, there was a tradition of serving fish during Lent in adherence to the practice of abstaining from meat on ash, Wednesday and all Fridays. This meant that kids would get fish sticks or canned tuna, among other tasty fish dishes. Your local newspaper would sometimes get involved in the mix by printing out the weekly school lunch menus. This was a handy tool for moms who were planning their kids' meals for the week. They could see what was being offered at school and decide whether to have their children eat there or pack a lunch from home. For those days when moms didn't want their kids eating the nutrition barren food at school, they turned into lunch ladies in the morning. Packing lunches from home was a common practice among moms in the 1950s. The go-to option for many moms was sandwiches, which were easy to prepare, pack, and eat. Classic sandwich choices that kids loved were ham and cheese or PB and J. They would wrap these sandwiches in love and wax paper. Apart from sandwiches, moms also added some veggies to balance out the meal. Celery sticks or carrot sticks were popular choices because one, they were easy to chew on, and two, they could nibble away just like everyone's favorite cartoon rabbit, Bugs Bunny. These crunchy vegetables added texture and nutrients to the lunch, which was a perfect balance to the softness of sandwiches. As for snacks, crackers were a no-brainer. It didn't matter if it was saltine crackers, graham crackers, or cheese crackers. They all had that crunch that all kids enjoyed. At least I did. When it came to beverages, moms had a wider range to choose from compared to what schools offered, but thankfully, it wasn't quite as daring. The drink selection in France. While schools only served milk, moms gave their kids thermoses of homemade lemonade, iced tea, or just plain water. Moms took great pride in making sandwiches for their kids' lunches, often starting from scratch with homemade bread. Making bread from scratch was a labor of love, with moms kneading the dough, letting it rise, and then baking it to perfection. The result was a loaf of bread that was fresh, fragrant, and made with care. They would then slice the homemade bread into thick, hearty slices. These slices were not always perfectly uniform, with some being thicker or thinner than others. This homemade touch 
while filled with love and attention, could sometimes lead to a bit of embarrassment for kids who got made fun of for having weird sandwiches. One thing people don't really talk about is how some children felt self-conscious about bringing their homemade lunch to school. The uneven cuts of homemade bread could stand out among the neatly packaged cafeteria bought lunches of their peers. This feeling of embarrassment or humiliation, though unintentional, on the part of the moms was a reality for some kids. That being said, we have to give 1950s moms their flowers. The homemade sandwiches made with love by their moms were a source of comfort and nourishment. The taste of homemade bread paired with fillings like ham and cheese or PB and J created a lunchtime experience that pre-packaged lunches couldn't ever hope to replicate. We love you moms. Now that we have our embarrassing sandwiches packed and ready to go, where do we put it? Surely we can't squeeze it in between our books. This sounds like a job for Hopalong Cassidy. In the 1950s, TV-themed lunchboxes became all the rage among kids. These lunchboxes had their favorite characters from their favorite television shows of the time, and the earliest and most iconic TV-themed lunchboxes was the Hopalong Cassidy lunchbox. Hopalong Cassidy was a beloved cowboy character portrayed by actor William Boyd, who became a sensation on television during the 1950s. His lunchbox featured images of Hopalong Cassidy in action-packed scenes, riding his horse or caught up in daring adventures on the frontier. And with that, it's time to send you off. Would you rather spend half a dollar on an empty calorie lunch in the cafeteria or power through the embarrassment of an uneven sandwich in a Hopalong Cassidy lunchbox? Feel free to share your answer in the comments below. And if you like the video, please consider subscribing to the channel. That's all for now. I'll see you in the next one.